Welcome to Beneath the Bible, where we're helping you dig deeper and uncover the world beneath the sacred book. Today we're going to tackle a difficult subject when it comes to the Bible and its ancient context. The topics of warfare, holy war, and a concept called harem, often translated total destruction or something similar. These biblical ideas are some of the most disturbing to our modern sensibilities, even leading some people to discredit the Bible's moral authority because of places where it sanctions war, and even the total elimination of entire people groups. Now, we see examples of harem in the conquest narrative in the book of Joshua. When the Israelites attack Jericho, this is what it says. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpets sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it, but they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. We see Harem later in 1 Samuel with God's commandment for Saul's army to totally destroy the Amalekites. This is what the Lord Almighty says, I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Now, if these passages are unsettling to you, you're not alone. They're disturbing to me, too. I mean, if God is love, these commands to totally destroy entire cities and groups of people seem like the opposite of love, right? Could they really have come from God? Or were the Israelites using religion to justify their actions? Now, we won't pretend to bring the debate around these questions to an end in today's video, but we do think that understanding warfare and harem in their ancient context is essential to understanding why they show up in the Bible at all, and why they aren't instructions for us today like they were for the Israelites back then. Let's start by digging into the nature of warfare in the ancient Near East. First off, it's important to note that essentially all war in the ancient world was what may be considered holy war. That is to say, in the ancient world, the gods were always involved in war, at some level or another. So at the risk of oversimplifying, we want to focus on the two main ideas around warfare in the ancient world, particularly as they relate to the world of Mesopotamia and Anatolia, but that's partially just because that's where we have the most data to discuss. So the first concept is the understanding of the role of the king in his relation to the gods. Assyria gives us ample data on this subject. In Assyria and in Anatolia and Mesopotamia in general, the kings were not deified. The kings were the servants of the gods, but they were not themselves gods. So the king of Assyria was the servant of the national god, Asher. And in fact, in old Assyrian texts, only the god Asher is given the title king, while the earthly human figure is called the governor of Asher. This title is often written with the divine determinative, meaning the governor of the god Asher, not governor of the city of Asher. There is even a royal coronation ritual from early Assyrian history through at least the Middle Assyrian period that states the god Asher is king and the name of the ruler in charge now is his delegate. The king serves the gods and he does the will of the gods. He takes care of their temples. He has prophets and diviners who determine the will of the gods and then he enacts what the gods want on earth. And the gods often want to enlarge the territory of the king. We have a Neo-Assyrian hymn dating to the reign of Ashurbanipal that essentially says as much. The king to Kulti Ninurta I in the 13th century takes on the epithet Merapesh Mitsri, or enlarger of the territory. So what is the rationale the gods may have for expanding the territory? Well, while the gods may be national, like Asher was the god of the city of Asher and its people, the gods could also be universalized. 
in theory, the gods were over all the universe. This is seen in the titles and cosmic offices ascribed to the various deities. Asher is king of all the great gods. Ishtar is the one whose name is called in all the corners of the land. Shamash is the light of all lands. So if the gods were over all of the lands, then all the lands owed them proper recognition as servants of the gods. Foreign lands then existed in a state of rebellion against the gods. When foreign people withheld the tribute tax of Asher, they were insubordinate and lacked proper submission to divine will, the divine will the king was supposed to enforce. The divine will was to bring proper order to the world, and insubordinate peoples acted to disorder the world. Mario Liverani puts it this way, Only the inner country, dependent as it was on the divine mandate, was a cosmic country where law and order, justice, and peace were to be ensured. The outer countries were a chaotic part of the universe, lacking the positive qualities of the inner country because they were unaware of, or worse, resistant to the supreme rule of the central and supreme god, Asher in the case of Assyria. So by extending the border, the king was turning chaos into order. He was engaging in an act of creation by further ordering the world. Kings like tiglath pileser III, Sargon II, and Sennacherib draw on the language of the Enuma Elish and liken their enemies to the minions of Tiamat. They too are overcoming chaos and bringing the world further into being. Liverani adds, the conquest of the world added to the glory of Asher and the Assyrian king, but was also to the advantage of the conquered peoples who were finally inserted, they too, into the cosmos that was governed by divine rule. Warfare and expansion was a kind of civilizing act, bringing people from disorder to order and into proper relationship with the gods. The other rationale for war in the ancient world had a legal framework. War was like a trial by combat, but on a national scale. Relations between states, including between peers, but also between vassals and suzerains, were mediated by treaties and various oaths of loyalty. Deities often functioned as witnesses or guarantors of these formal relationships. Any breach between the parties could result in war, with the conflict functioning like a legal battle with the gods serving as judges. Remember, in the ancient world, the gods were often perceived as not omniscient or even fully just, so in their role as judge, they were just like human judges, with strengths and weaknesses rather than a perfect sense of justice. This legal framework for war is made clear in a number of ancient sources. In the epic of Tikulti Ninurta, the eponymous Assyrian king is going to war with the king of the Kassites. The Kassite king at one point states, Come to me in the battle of the servants. Let us establish the facts together. In that festival of battle, may the breaker of the oath not rise up. May they cast down his corpse. Battle was a way to determine who was right between the two. The gods would judge who was in fact in the right. The winner in combat would be the one who the gods had sided with. The Hittite king Marshili II alludes to this in a letter to a kingdom to his west where he states, Because I asked you for my subjects back, those who had come to you, and you did not give them back to me, and kept calling me a child and belittling me, Come now, let us do battle, and the storm god, my lord, shall judge our case. Now, to go along with this idea that the gods, like human judges, could be swayed, people knew that the gods had wills and desires that certain parties triumph over others, just like human judges. Before battle, divination and various oracles were consulted to ensure divine favor in various military endeavors, because in either model of war, the gods determine the victor, so you should be sure to do whatever it takes to get divine favor. So again, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but in general, these are the two models for understanding warfare in the ancient Near East. It was either done on divine command to bring people into a properly ordered relationship with the gods and their representative, or as a kind of divine lawsuit where the gods were judges and the nations fought with the winner being the divinely appointed winner. This may work for the nations of the ancient Near East, but is this how the ancient Israelite kingdoms thought about warfare? So when we look at the evidence from the Bible, we see that Israel and Judah generally had similar understandings of warfare as their neighbors, though there are a few distinctions. We also see that Israel's different literary traditions had slightly different ideas about warfare over time. Now let's start with a history of Israelite warfare from the accounts set earliest in their history. The earliest wars of the people of Israel occurred during the time of Moses, so once there's an actual nation to do battle. In these conflicts, God is the primary actor. That there is a battle involving people seems to be kind of incidental. The battle against the Amalekites in Exodus 17 mentions going out to fight the Amalekites, but the whole narrative is about God and Moses. A few chapters earlier at the crossing of the Reed Sea, we see God again as the only actor. As the Israelites enter the Promised Land, they are described as partners with God who fights with them. 
Jephthah recounts the conquest of Transjordan and says God gave Sihon into Israel's hands, and then Israel defeated them. This account of warfare is a bit more synergistic. God gives Israel's enemies over to Israel, and then Israel does the fighting. We see this in Numbers, where Og, king of Bashan, is given over to Israel, and the Israelites are able to defeat him. The relationship of God giving the victory and Israel achieving it is formalized in the oracle statements we see in places like 1 Samuel 23 and 2 Samuel 5, which are just two examples of the stock phrase, God will give them into your hands. In 1 Samuel 14, Saul inquires if God will deliver his enemies into his hands, but he gets no response. By the time of David, however, we see Israel and Judah's perspective on warfare coming much closer to that of their neighbors. Even before David became a king, he saw God as a judge with David as a plaintiff. We also see that in Absalom's revolt. After Absalom is killed, a messenger tells David that God has judged in David's favor. God is often discussed in terms of being a judge. And if he is a judge, it is natural to see warfare as a kind of divine lawsuit. We can see this in Psalm 35, for example. Undergirding all this is the idea that Israel was in covenant with God. God was Israel's suzerain, and the suzerain-vassal relationship meant Israel's enemies were also God's enemies, and Israel's wars were God's wars. It seems that, at least in the time of David, Israelite warfare was considered a kind of lawsuit, with God as judge determining the victor. This is the same way we see warfare conceived of by Israel's neighbors. We also see God portrayed as a divine warrior. He is strong and mighty, and mighty in battle. God is David's great warrior. We see God is given the same kind of title of a mighty warrior that we see applied to David, to many of the judges, and to David's mighty men, all noted heroes and warriors. We're supposed to think of God in the same sense as these warriors. A common epithet of God is Lord of Hosts, or at least that's usually how it's translated. Scholars have suggested a number of other ways of translating it, like Yahweh the Mighty One, Yahweh Hosts of the Celestial Army, Yahweh Militant, Yahweh of Armies, and so on. Not only does God have titles of the Divine Warrior, but he was understood to go before Israel in battle and intervene in battle, as we see in 2 Samuel 5. The idea that God marched before the king in battle, as we see in this passage, is, like the lawsuit motif, one that is common in the ancient Near East. So, to summarize a bit, in ancient Israel, the people of Israel were in a covenantal relationship with God, who acted as their suzerain, as all Near Eastern international relations were medi mediated through such legal relationships, we can see Israel's idea of warfare being framed in terms of a divine lawsuit with God serving as judge. We also see God is thought of as a divine warrior who fights on behalf of Israel, particularly on behalf of the king. In the earliest part of Israel's national history, the warrior God fights entirely on his own on their behalf, as at the Reed Sea. The Israelites understood the outcome of war to be in the hands of God, so they often inquired if God would deliver their enemies into their hands. So, ancient Israel's ideas about warfare really weren't that different from those of their neighbors, except, it seems, for one idea, the harem, or so-called holy war. All right, so this is probably why you clicked on this video. What is the harem? How did it work in ancient Israel? Furthermore, how do we handle this idea that God had his people slaughter thousands of people? Well, I'll talk about the first part, and Kyle can handle the rest of that. So the word harem or harem is used a number of times in the Bible. The term is used to refer to things not appropriate for common usage, either because the item is devoted to God or because it is an abomination and allotted for destruction. Those probably seem like two very different concepts, but we'll talk about how they're related pretty soon. So in Leviticus and Numbers, we see that things like fields or first fruits can be devoted to God. They can be harem. At that point, when they are designated as harem, they belong to God and are not for common use. The consequences for transgressing this ban are severe. Achan does this after the conquest of Jericho in Joshua 7 by stealing some of the plunder that was dedicated to God. He is put to death because of his transgression of the ban, taking what belonged to God. But this isn't really the usage people tend to have a problem with. The problem comes with the second usage, because we also see people and animals are harem when they are allotted for destruction. 
In the Bible, when the term harem is used in the context of warfare, it appears overwhelmingly in what we call Deuteronomistic literature. These are books that share a common theological perspective found in the books of Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. And even then, the concept is almost entirely absent from Samuel and Kings. That means we have this phrase mostly used in relation to warfare in a couple of books that deal with Israel's entry into the land. The Harem War seems to be isolated to this period of initial conquest. Now, I don't have time or frankly the energy to go review here all of the academic literature on this because it is extensive. So that's in part because there are differences of opinion on some of the shades of meaning in the usage of Harem in these texts. There are a few ideas that I think are worth discussing though as they are relatively recent and are either the most nuanced or include the most relevant data in their research. The first is the work of P.D. Stern. Stern's book, The Biblical Harem, has been criticized, I think fairly, but his study is nuanced and in-depth and currently seems to be the standard from which current works begin. If you want to work on the idea of harem in the Bible, you gotta deal with Stern and his book. What Stern argues is that harem is used in reference to the idea of a cosmic struggle between chaos and order. Two forces we see at odds with one another throughout the Bible, going all the way back to the creation accounts in Genesis. Harem is an extreme order in response to chaos. Stern simply states the term harem is in a matrix of terms having to do with the struggle for land and an ordered existence. But he sees the fullest expression of the harem at Jericho, which is symbolic of Israel's first entrance into the land, the initial act of conquest which begins the new ordered life of Israel in the promised land, where the chaotic foe is not cosmic, but the inhabitants of the land, or the Canaanites. The ordering of creation in seven days is kind of echoed in the seven days of walking around Jericho, and in a sense linked the two as both creative and ordering activities. It's also notable that the term is used in Deuteronomistic literature. And while these books recount events of the settlement period, the literature itself was not initially written until the late eighth century and into the seventh century. And that was also a time when Judah, where the Deuteronomistic literature was written, was facing quite a few external threats. They were facing their own chaos, threats to their ordered existence in the land. It wasn't the Canaanites who threatened their ordered life, but the Assyrians. It seems natural that in this period, ideas of harem would become a pretty potent martial concept. Stern sees the harem as a particularly Israelite phenomenon, but others have highlighted how this is not necessarily a primarily martial idea, nor primarily Israelite. Instead, it's been suggested that harem could be a generally West Semitic idea that related to gift exchange. It would not primarily be a kind of warfare, but a concept of devoting items as gifts. Now, the second assertion is that this is not an exclusively Israelite phenomenon, and this is increasingly clear. The term is used in the Mesha Stella, and we have a whole video on that artifact you can check out here. And in that text, we see Mesha say, for example, he took Nebo, a, an Israelite settlement, and said, 7,000 men and women, both natives and aliens and female slaves, I devoted it to Ashtar Chemosh. This is a 9th century inscription, and that date's not really in doubt, which puts this concept of the harem or ban within the 9th century and predates the composition of the Deuteronomistic history. That is to say, while the Deuteronomist may have used this concept, it did not originate with them. It isn't something that was developed as part of the Deuteronomistic theology in the 7th century and beyond. It is an idea that existed within the West Semitic world by the 9th century, and we may surmise it originated much earlier. In fact, some scholars suggest the harem is just part of a much larger literary topos, which includes receiving an oracle, departure, battle, capturing a city, killing its inhabitants, harem, and looting the city, and then possibly the construction of a cult shrine. Lauren Monroe also points to a Sabaean text which mentions harem. The excitingly named text RES3945 is from the kingdom of Saba in what is now Yemen. It's not clear when the text dates to, with different scholars offering different rationales for various dates, but the 7th or 8th century is kind of in the ballpark. And the text has one mention of something being harem. It states, But the city of Nashan he forbade to be burnt, and he instructed him to destroy his palace, a tribal name, and his city, Nashan, and imposed on Nashan a tribute for the priests, and he gave command concerning those of Nashan, whose dedication to the gods was allotted so that they were killed, and he instructed this other tribal name, and Nashan, that Sabaeans should settle in the city, Nashan, and this tribal name, and Nashan should build a temple for another tribal name in the midst of the city, Nashan. Now, this is a usage of the same root of the Hebrew word harem. These words seem to be related, but there the usage is not clearly linked with any kind of holy war or even any kind of divinely sanctioned war. 
This has a more profane usage. Laura Monroe has suggested then that harem is not primarily cultic in nature, but has a much wider usage in the context of people, land, and their gods. In Israel, that relationship was expressed in a covenant. She suggests that this idea is deeply rooted in Israelite tradition, not a 7th century innovation, and that it is inextricably linked with the development of Israelite collective identity and state formation. Harem for Israel and other nations is invoked only when a new people are being established in a new land. Monroe notes that the building of a cult installation is a culminating event after conquest. Both the building of a cult installation and imposition of the harem serves as expressions of the integrity of the relationship between a people on its land and the god from whom that land was granted. Guarding this exclusive relationship through the enactment of harem constitutes an assertion of collective identity both internally and externally with the surrounding nations as witnesses. Thus, the purpose of harem is not only to destroy an enemy, it is positively linked to the binding of a new population to the land it has conquered. Now, I don't know that Monroe's idea and Stern's are entirely mutually exclusive. I think it's possible that the process Monroe outlines could have been envisioned in terms of order overcoming chaos, which Stern advocates. It seems to me that how this idea was envisioned and how old a tradition it is isn't clear and probably won't be clear barring the discovery of more data, which can give some more insight. But as it stands, Harem does seem to be an old tradition wherein people eliminated the former inhabitants of a land and established themselves in the land with the assistance of their god. This may have been conceived as an overcoming chaos and establishing order. Being established in a new land may have been thought of as a kind of creation, especially as establishing cult sites seems to be a common feature of creation accounts as well as the practice of harem. This older tradition was likely a less salient feature in life after the development of the state, but it may have become significant again as threats to the state emerged centuries later. Well, hopefully you now have a better understanding of warfare and the concept of harem in the ancient world. But that may still leave you with the question, how does all of this justify God's commands for the Israelites to wage war and execute harem against their enemies? Now, again, I don't think we can offer an explanation that can fully put this question to rest, but I do think seeing warfare and harem in their ancient context can help us see both its purpose in ancient Israel, as well as its limits, and even why this concept doesn't apply to us today. Well, let's start with the purpose of harem in ancient Israel. Harem did not apply to all Israelite warfare. We see that it was tied to the establishment of the Israelites in their new land and the establishment of their covenant with Yahweh. It created a place in which they could live their lives according to Yahweh's cosmic order. It seems that the only way to do this was to eliminate every trace of the old inhabitants of the land who represented a disordered way opposed to Yahweh. Not only all people, including children, but livestock and presumably any cultic sites. We can see a, particular, a practical purpose for this. If you're going to establish a new way of life, anything from the previous way of life has to be eliminated completely, or the people will be subject to falling back under the influence of old ways. And it's for this reason that harem relates to both destruction and devotion. In order for the Israelites and their new homeland to be devoted to God, everything already in the promised land must be destroyed. The things that cannot be destroyed, like precious metals, must be devoted to Yahweh rather than to the gods of the Canaanites. In the Israelites' understanding, the land, its inhabitants, and its resources were all subject to Yahweh already. So, Yahweh had the right to command the Israelites to do with them as he pleased. Israel would have understood themselves as acting on God's behalf to bring order to a disordered land that was in rebellion against God. Harem was a condition of establishing God's covenant people in the land that God had promised to them. So, all of that makes sense in light of what we know about the way warfare was carried out in the ancient Near East. But that still leaves us with the more pressing and immediate questions about how or if these passages can provide any sort of guidance for people of faith today, or if they invalidate the moral authority of the Bible entirely. Now, again, I won't pretend to provide a definitive answer, but I can tell you how I think about these issues in light of history, as well as the arc of the Bible through the New Testament and Christian theology. I think we can start with the limitations of harem and how that limits the application of this concept for us today. Harem was not normative for Israelite warfare. 
It was the specific command of God in a specific time and place for a specific purpose. It wasn't meant to be applied as a general principle by the Israelites, and it especially wasn't meant to be applied generally by us today. Any attempt to identify modern peoples as enemies of God who are devoted to destruction is far out of bounds in light of the historical realities of harem and Israelite warfare. These are commands of God that I believe are bound to their ancient context and no longer apply to us today. And I believe that because I believe that in the culmination of Israel's establishment, Jesus came to teach all people a different way of life, a way to live without enemies. Jesus teaches us not to conquer by force, but to overcome evil with good. Jesus overturns the logic of an eye for an eye, something established in the Old Testament, to reveal the greater truth that we are to love our enemies and pray for those who mistreat us, thereby breaking the cycle of violence and retribution. Jesus teaches us to envision a future where wars cease, where the shalom of God is established in every place, and where the perfect order of God will be fully realized as the forces that are opposed to God are brought to an end. And Jesus promises that this perfect peace will one day be established by his return to set right everything that is wrong in the world. But how do we reconcile that vision of peace and love with the realities of warfare and harem in the Old Testament? Well, I think we have to go back to the basic fact that the world of ancient Israel is far different from our world in some fundamental ways. The idea of a war waging God is offensive to our modern sensibilities, but it's perfectly at home in the ancient world. After all, if your God won't fight for you and defend you, what good is that God? We also need to recognize that the establishment of Israel, of God's covenant people set apart from the surrounding nations, was essential to the eventual coming of Jesus. God seems to have worked within the frameworks of ancient peoples to bring about God's eventual plan for the salvation of the world and the establishment of God's shalom forever. It also seems that even in ancient Israel, the harem command was not carried out completely. Pockets of Canaanite peoples and culture persisted even after the establishment of Israel. So it seems that their total destruction never became reality. And that proved problematic for Israel. The worship of Canaanite gods was a constant temptation, pulling Israel away from unwavering faithfulness to Yahweh. Now, this same, same temptation to unfaithfulness caused the concept of harem to resurface in later Israelite literature, written as Israel was first divided, then facing existential threats from the great Iron Age kingdoms. Israel looked to its history for answers on how to deal with its present reality, and it found them in these accounts of unwavering obedience to Yahweh, such that anything outside of Yahweh's ordered cosmos was devoted to destruction. Now, that doesn't tie together all the questions of how this destruction of life and property could be justified in God's name, but I do think it gives us a helpful application for today. Rather than applying the concept of harem to external enemies, a futile endeavor as we've said, we should apply it to the enemies of God within us. What is it in our lives that is opposed to God's order? What is it in our hearts that must be completely destroyed in order for us to be fully devoted to God? There are many things we could name, but I think we can even include the very things that make us uneasy about warfare and harem, an end to the disorder of violence and retribution, and the establishment of a new way of love and peace. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. If you want to learn more about this topic, be sure to check out our references and resources in the description below. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more content like it, be sure to subscribe and check out our videos on the Mesha Stella and on child sacrifice in the ancient world, both of which also relate to ancient Near Eastern warfare. Finally, if you want to support the work that we're doing, you can become one of our Beneath the Bible excavators through channel membership at the join button below or on our channel homepage. For about five bucks a month, you'll get early access to each video we publish, and you'll get to be part of a monthly video call with us. If you learned something new today, take a minute to share this video with your friends. And until next time, keep digging.